Hello and welcome to Psychological Insights. Today's topic of the day is sadomasochism, has a lot of sexual overtones. But could this be just about a scene out of billiards or Fifty Shades of Grey? After all, this is Psychological Insights. There's got to be more to it than that. And to talk about that, we're going to be talking, we're going to be speaking to Dr. Robert Hamm. He is a psychologist in West Hartford Center. I'm Pat Kasikoff. You don't want to miss this one. Stay with me. So, Dr. Ham, sadomasochism. Yeah, pretty juicy stuff, huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well, first of all, it does have overtones of sexual deviance, or is that just my imagination? Yeah, no, um, yeah, sadomasochism, certainly, uh, if that doesn't have uh, sexual overtones, I don't know what it does. Okay, good. So I'm, I'm in the right ballpark. Um, and I understand also that in 1980, uh, according to the uh, DS, uh, the DSM, the Diagnostical uh, Statistical Manual, it um, it got out of the manual, and instead they replaced it with uh, self-defeating personality disorder. Yes, it, um, it was uh, studied as. Uh, potentially one of the uh, uh, many uh, different kinds of personality disorders, um, but it was uh, sort of a marginal category, uh, somewhat controversial for the reasons that uh, you gave. It has a, a lot of sexual overtones. So they suggested that maybe we can change the name to uh, self-defeating personality disorder. That sounds uh, a little bit more acceptable. Um, how, did, uh, how did that work? Uh, well, uh, it was uh, considered to be a um, sort of quasi category uh, in the third uh, edition, but by the time the fourth edition came along, uh, they decided to drop it all together. It was, still had a lot of controversy, not because it's sexual, but because it's sexist, uh, that uh, masochistic personality disorder per se um, often is associated with women in particular uh, and it goes against uh, the you know the attempts to change our attitudes about women's roles in society so it, it, it was voted down and never got included as an official category so um, I'm listening to you and I'm hearing a backstory of a lot of history. Talk a little bit about the history of um, sadomasochism. Right, well, I mean, some authors say that it's a relatively new phenomenon. I'm not convinced of that, but um, it was first identified. It, actually, the term was actually coined by a, a physician who wrote a book, um, called um, uh, Psychopathia uh, Sexualis, something like that in the 1800s. His name was uh, Richard von Kraft Ebbing. Uh, and he was the one that coined the term masochism. Uh, masochism comes from uh, the name of an author, uh, Leopold von Sacher Masak. Okay, I can understand that, von Sacher Masak. Who evidently did, masochism that makes perfect sense. He was, he evidently wasn't happy uh, to learn that his name was associated with uh, the theme of his book. He wrote a novel called Venus and Furs, uh, which was eventually made into a play uh, by David Ives and then a movie by Roland Polanski um, of the same name about a man who uh, uh, becomes involved with a woman and he um, uh, uh, elicits a, a relationship with her that is uh, masochistic, where he becomes her sex slave. So I wasn't so far off when I mentioned the scene out of billiards 
or Fifty Shades of Grey. Yeah, I, have, I, I don't know about billiards. I certainly know about Fifty Shades of Grey. Uh, there was a book that came out many years ago called Story of All um, about a masochistic, uh, masochistic theme. So it is a theme that uh, you would find sometimes in novels, movies. Uh, it fascinates people. It's uh, associated with sexual deviance, what we call paraphilias today. So that's the history. That's where it began in modern times. And then Freud uh, uh, had picked it up and talked about it uh, in his early writings and formulated different explanations. Uh, is it some kind of a fixation at a certain stage of uh, a development? Uh, and eventually he came to explain it as sort of a, a blend of the life and the death instinct, uh, you know, finding pleasure and pain. Um, but the first person to talk about this as a character uh, a deficiency, if you will, a type was Wilhelm Reich, uh, R E I C H, who was a, a psychoanalyst, a, a student of Freud's uh, back in the 1920s. So, how does, I mean, I mean, it, it has a wealthy history. I'm listening to you, and you've quoted three or four authors uh, while you're speaking. So, there is a healthy history. But what, something I mentioned at the beginning, this self defeating personality disorder. What is that all about? How does that relate back to the sadomasochism? Uh, well, at one time it was believed that uh, that the two are related, uh, that um, well, Freud believed that was its origins. It's, uh, Freud believed everything was sexual in origin, as we know. Um, and uh, moreover, uh, some people associated the sexual practice that people engage in this kind of uh, paraphilia also had uh, these kinds of personality traits uh, that are self-defeating. Um, but uh, in, in modern times, as time went on, that, uh, that association has um, sort of uh, gone by the wayside for the most part. When the sexual orientation, that's well, what's the, gone by the wayside? Well, not orientation, but sexual practice. But um, yes, the uh, association between uh, uh, paraphilia, uh, masochism itself, practice, and uh, the personality type, the self-defeating personality. Today, um, most um, uh, experts uh, believe that the two are largely unrelated. Now, sometimes you will find that uh, one is an outgrowth of the other. Um, and I recall uh, working with a patient who had a history of trauma, uh, sexual um, abuse in childhood, and it um, sort of reenacted itself in his life, in his sexual life, and in certain pseudo-mysticistic uh, personality uh, traits. So, so these um, self-defeating personality traits, um, I, I think more people could probably identify with these traits than they can with, what did you call it, paraphilias? Uh, paraphilia, that's right, uh, what we call uh, sec uh, sexual deviance. That's so right. Talk yeah. to me a little bit about the personality uh, traits that are inherent to these kinds of people. Well, uh, when the DSM was uh, um, mulling around whether we should include this as part of our um, uh, taxonomy of mental disorders, they came up with criteria and you had to meet five of uh, nine or so uh, different uh, characteristics. Uh, and they would include uh, things uh, such as uh, someone who chooses someone who uh, is destructive or is abusive in some way. Uh, there's a pattern, not just one relationship, but there's a pattern of people who uh, uh, get involved in relationships where their partners are abusive in some way. Uh, people who uh, can be uh, very self-effacing, they don't accept uh, praise, um, or uh, they uh, are, uh, reluctant uh, to uh, admit that they're enjoying things in life. Um, they reject help from other people. 
Um, I'm just looking at a, a list here I wrote down of their criteria from the 1980 DSM. Uh, they're not interested in people who treat them well. They engage in uh, unsolicited self-sacrifice. Uh, they don't accomplish tasks they do. Uh, sometimes pe uh, complainers, people who complain, you, know, you may know, know a few of those. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm listening to your criteria and you mentioned that you have to, that you have to, um, you have to qualify, you have to have five of the traits in order to be diagnosed um, as such. But I'm listening to your criteria and most of us exhibit some of those criteria some of the time. That's right. I mean, it, uh, I think that um, if you look at any personality disorder and you look at the criteria you know, by which they they judge a person, they're, they're evident in most people's uh, lives. Um, they, we manifest them uh, in different ways. It's, it's only a disorder if it becomes part and more pervasive, becomes a part personality. That's why it's personality disorder. Uh, and it's a repeated pattern. And so it's something that's self-defeating. It's something that happens over and over, even though, you know, we say we should, you know, uh, we, we should learn from experience. And it seems is people with personality disorders, they don't, they don't learn from experience. And that's why it's a disorder, not because they don't lack the intelligence, but intelligence, but they lack the insight. They, they can't see you know, uh, themselves as we see them because of their defenses. And this is why uh, it has taken on a, a lot of interest in the psychoanalytic community, of course, uh, more than any other uh, 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 in entity in psychology because psychoanalysis deals with our subconscious. What about, uh, you, you referenced it, but just mildly, the difference between men and women. I mean, I notice, you know, I, men relate to it differently than women do. What, what is the, is there a difference? Yeah, I mean, as we were saying a little while ago, I mean, there is, it has been a controversial topic and that's one of the reasons why it's not in the DSM. Um, so back in Freud's days, it was uh, masochism was generally associated, as was hysteria, with women, uh, and it was considered a sign of characterological weakness. So masochism is generally associated with people, excuse me, who have a tendency not to have self-confidence, who are unassertive, and they are dependent in relationships. Uh, so naturally, if this is the role that women have been assigned in society, especially in Victorian times, uh, it's going to be associated with gender. Uh, and so Freud and some of his follower, followers, even women, Marie Bonaparte and Helena Deutsch, uh, and, uh, uh, described this uh, character disorder as something that is pretty much uh, endemic to women in particular. But it wasn't long after, uh, after that that uh, psychoanalysts such as Karen Horney um, and then other theorists uh, subsequently objected uh, to uh, this um, sort of assignation of these character flaws um, associated with women. Uh, so Karen Horney did uh, write about masochism. Uh, she wrote about personality disorders but it said that it was mostly an outgrowth of uh, how people are socialized uh, you know, rather than something about women in particular. And then uh, more uh, recently, uh, Harvard psychologist Paula John Kaplan uh, wrote a book about uh, masochism in women. Uh, and um, her main thesis is this is something that is a bias in our society so that Masochism is interpreted um, when uh, these kinds of qualities or traits that we associated with self-defeating personality disorder are seen in women, uh, they're uh, on, uh, sort of interpreted as being signs of masochism. Whereas, Whereas in, men, men, in men, it looks like stoicism. That's right. Men are, men, it's strong. They're stoic. Right, exactly. They're able to with, uh, withstand trouble. That's right. So, I mean, stoicism, I mean, 
Masochism, uh, you know, is related to suffering, isn't it? Uh, the capacity to withstand suffering, or is it the people are attracted to suffering? Um, it's, it's not always clear. Um, so uh, suffering isn't necessarily uh, an unhealthy thing. It's not necessarily destructive. So the ancient Stoics uh, from ancient uh, Greece, uh, you know, established a philosophy which said that suffering is good. It helps us to build character. Uh, Marcus Aurelius in his book, Meditations, uh, you know, talked about that. Um, and uh, Nietzsche's famous quote, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. whatever doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Um, so, in, you know, these kinds of aphorisms, these belief systems, there's a lot of truth to them. Um, so there was a psychoanalyst back in the 1940s, Theodore Reich, who uh, talked to, he wrote a book, Masochism and Modern Man. Um, and he uh, helped to um, sort of tease out uh, the different dimensions of masochism and helped us to discern, well, how do we differentiate when is masochism or suffering, I should say, healthy and when is it masochism? And so when is it healthy and when is it masochism? Like what's the... Like, when do you know the difference? Uh, well, the masochist um, is generally, is, as I was saying, it, uh, develops a pattern in their lives of self-defeating behaviors. And uh, it continues uh, without change because they don't have insight. And the gains that they get from it, um, you know, by manipulating other people and uh, taking advantage of their suffering, um, uh, they are not aware of. Uh, they don't own, they disown it. Um, and, and so if it's subconscious, if it's a repeated pattern that people are not aware of, uh, that's destructive in nature, uh, then it's more likely to be something that, you know, we would associate with uh, a personality disorder. Whereas so let, let me ask you the question, because you, you often reference uh, your patients or people that you've seen is there a large percentage of people that come to you which you would diagnose with sadomasochism or self-defeating personality disorder? Is this common? Is this uncommon? Yeah, I don't know what, uh, frankly, what the statistics are, how, uh, what the prevalence is. I'd say it's very low um, if we're identifying people who actually would meet these criteria. Um, you know, in the DSM back in 1980. But many of us have some qualities of it, more or less, as all personality disorders, most people have certain features. Uh, and all of us exhibit some of these behaviors uh, at different times in our lives or in different moments. But as far as being a card carrying, so to speak, a masochistic personality, I mean, I, I don't know, I would guess probably 1% of the population that's just a, a guess. Well, the thing that would mo what interests me most is this concept of the suppression of joy. That in other words, the person is feeling joy and happiness, but doesn't express that. So th that's like an awkward personality. You don't know whether you're coming or going when you're with those people. I would think that that would be quite obvious. Well, you might know these people, uh, you know, Winnie the Pooh's Eeyore's. Sorry? Uh, Winnie the Pooh, Eeyore. You uh -huh. may know that character. Um, I'm not a Winnie the Pooh fan necessarily, but I know the character. Uh, someone who is a, you know, a Debbie Downer, someone who, you know, whatever expression uh, you may know some people like that. Uh, someone who is a tragic figure. I mean, tragedy happens to all of us, you know, at different times, unfortunately, that's life. Uh, but people who seem to kind of be a vortex, vortex of tragedy, uh, they, um, you know, this, uh, you know I, I don't believe in this law of attraction, but it's as though some people do seem to be uh, like that. Um, it's, um, so- they said What I'm hearing is that these are people who enjoy their suffering and their tragedy. They, they have some sort of joy in that. Yes, it, it does. I think that there's some truth to that. Uh, that's the paradox of it. 
But I think that uh, there's more suffering uh, ultimately, and it's a tragedy because I, I don't think that uh, people with this disorder uh, are happy. Um, I think there, there's a, a joy, I think there's a gain, there's a pleasure, uh, there's, it's a pyrrhic victory, if you will, um, to be miserable. Um, so I, I think people with this disorder um, have low self-esteem, they have dependency, it's a fear of being alone, uh, as uh, Theodore Reich said. I agree with that, Esther Menneker uh, also identified that as a cardinal feature. So I, I think it's a, a, a lack of self-esteem, lack of self-confidence, but it's personality pattern uh, that comes from a learned helplessness, I believe. Where does this pattern come from? So it usually comes from uh, children who have come from dysfunctional families in one way or another. There's no one type of uh, dysfunctional relationship, uh, but uh, as all personality disorders uh, do, they come from dysfunctional learning patterns associated with uh, some kind of trauma or a dysfunctional family environment that they grew up in. So we might find a child who has been abused or neglected or uh, has uh, had to serve the role as a parent to a a parent to a parent um, for one reason or another, or who have been um, neglected except when they are um, in trouble uh, or ill, uh, in dire need, so that they're reinforced for being uh, sick or unhappy. Uh, and then a pattern is set up in a person's life uh, where they don't feel confident uh, their uh, sense of empowerment in life has been squelched, uh, has been discouraged, or hasn't been fostered, let's say. So they find another way to achieve love in relationships and self-esteem. Uh, so we might find, uh, as uh, Theodore Reich pointed out, it, it, but I think very insightfully, uh, that masochism uh, is basically, uh, comes down to a need to be loved. Uh, but uh, <clears throat> but these characters are not lovable the way you're describing them. No, they're not. Uh, but nonetheless, they come from a sort of an object related sort of need, need to be loved, but also a narcissistic need. I mean, as Reich uh, pointed out, that erotic or romantic love uh, comes from a, a sort of a state of insufficiency in oneself. And so one looks to get from the other what one cannot give to oneself. Um, so, uh, this, so in, in uh, sort of a uh, learned helplessness, uh, uh, low self-esteem, uh, uh, inability to assert oneself. So one gets one's needs, otherwise with this disorder uh, by manipulating others uh, to give to them what they cannot uh, obtain for themselves. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's not a lovable feature. Uh, they can be very exhausting and off-putting for those reasons. Usually uh, personality disorders do. I think it's, uh, it's pretty well um, uh, known today that, uh, that uh, uh, repeated patterns are learned. <clears throat> and uh, those learning uh, environments begin with our childhoods. Um, so, uh, so how does one explain when you have two children in the family and only one gets this problem? Um, I mean, we're talking about the nurture versus nature debate, I think. Uh, yes, well, many people ask me that, uh, but ironically, I think that uh, siblings often are more different from one another than they are from their friends in many ways. Uh, that's the dynamics of families. Uh, so, uh, yes, we often find very, uh, very uh, contrasting personalities. Uh, so even though uh, children are um, uh, usually brought up in the same households, they uh, find different roles that they play in families. Uh, and uh, often uh, those uh, roles sometimes uh, create rivalries and, you know, or uh, ch some children are favored more than others. Uh, in families, uh, so dynamics are set up in that way. Um, so in conclusion, what would you uh, recommend uh, 
people do with this. I mean, this is like a, this can ruin your life, what I'm hearing from you. Uh, well, I, a masochistic uh, personality disorder per se is not something that, uh, unlike uh, many of my uh, programs, um, I offer advice on what people can do um, uh, themselves and give some tips. But this is a personality disorder that really is best treated by a professional, uh, someone who is able to, uh, has some experience and training uh, or has a, quite a bit of that to understand the dynamics associated with this disorder. Um, but generally speaking, it's a matter of learning how to love oneself and to embrace one, one's power. Uh, uh, and with person, uh, masochistic personality also means because it's a, a personality disorder, some degree of insight is necessary uh, for them to see that the uh, gains that they get uh, with these behavioral patterns are, are more uh, destructive than they are beneficial in their lives. One last question. Um, do these people as a rule get married? Like, do they have, uh, you know, do they have like full families, like wives and children and, and husbands and do they have all that? Uh, yes, uh, masochistic personality runs the gamut of, of uh, degree. I mean, some people uh, with this disorder are, are very disturbed. Uh, so we may find uh, that certain individuals uh, engage in self-destructive behavior that uh, can be dangerous, uh, threatening suicide or self-inflicted wounds, um, self-injurious behaviors. Um, so uh, it... Uh, in those instances, um, uh, they, they may actually uh, be susceptible to dissociative disorders, uh, dissociative states of mind, uh, and self-injurious behavior as a way of coping with that. Um, or they can be mild symptoms of, uh, um, as I said, someone who's a complainer, uh, someone who tends to push uh, their partner's buttons, uh, and even though they know better, they do it anyway, uh, and it creates uh, turmoil in a relationship. Uh, but uh, it's so it, we can say that's a kind of a self defeating behavior that they don't have insight into. You would think they'd know better and they keep doing it. So with that, um, I'm gonna I'm gonna make a recommendation, and I never make this recommendation, but I think this disorder really needs a skilled professional to deal with because there's nobody who could have the insight into themselves or not a lot of people to know what their patterns are and what they're doing. It's rather complex. So with that, with my final recommendation, I'm gonna say thank you very much, Dr. Ham, um, another most interesting topic. And um, I'm looking forward to, uh, to seeing you next month with a new topic. Thank you.